Hello. Hi, P.T. Cog, and welcome to this special session. The exhibition at P.T. Cog is actually a, a big event. It's not really a shopping mall at P.T. Cog where you go for coffee and see what it is that you can bring home for your, for your significant others. Vendors are a crucial part of, of our field and our development, and we want to emphasize that. So today we are initiating a program to officially open the uh, exhibition. To do this, we have invited two distinguished speakers to share their experience in preparing, developing, and constructing uh, pro particle proton therapy centers. And they'll tell us about their particular experience within their cultural backgrounds and perhaps even let us know how the vendors played a role in that. So again, we have these two very, very uh, experienced individuals, and I would like to introduce the first speaker today. The first speaker is Abram Gordon. He's the executive director of Cincinnati Children's Proton Therapy Center. Gordon managed the uh, Children's Proton Therapy Center since June 2014, shortly after the construction. He oversaw the construction of the center and the integration of the center into the hospital operation. And that's since it was treating patients in 2016. The center recently treated its first patient on a clinical trial using flash treatment. How many of you actually knew that? I think it's important to realize uh, what, what, what our academic uh, hospitals are capable of and Gordon oversees the hospital's technology transfer and commercialization department. So maybe you'll be buying flash from him. In any case, please welcome uh, uh, Abram Gordon and who can share his experiences with us. Thank you very much, Jay, for the kind introduction. It's a pleasure to uh, speak at this, um, at this conference after hosting it uh, two years ago. Uh, for a little background on our center, uh, before I get to why we invested in uh, proton therapy, um, a little bit more of uh, how we made our selections and uh, some of our lessons learned. We are one of the uh, largest pediatric health systems in the country with uh, just under 700 registered beds. We're actually opening up our new critical care center in November. Um, we have about 1.3 million patient encounters uh, on a yearly basis, uh, 16,000 employees, um, 1,100 pediatric faculty, about a third of them are research only, two-thirds clinical, and uh, um, about $400 million year uh, research budget. Why we invested in uh, proton therapy? Um, uh, Cincinnati Children's is consistently rated as one of the top pediatric hospitals in the country. In 2002, uh, we had about 24 beds dedicated to oncology, which really just served um, our uh, kind of tri-state area uh, for oncology. And uh, at that point, we made a, a large investment in becoming uh, a national and international leader in pediatric cancers, uh, so much so that in uh, you know, this year after our critical care building opens, we'll have 100 uh, beds dedicated to um, cancer care. In 2008, uh, we realized that in order to remain a national international referral center, we really needed to have that availability of proton therapy um, in our city. And uh, uh, we, it would not be sustainable for our referral um, hospitals to send patients for proton therapy in one place and, and medical oncology care to another. So uh, once we decided uh, to um, get into proton therapy, we spent about uh, three plus years um, just visiting other proton centers, learning about proton therapy, 
as uh, the pediatric healthcare system, um, we, do, we did not have a Department of Radiation Oncology. All of our kids went to University of Cincinnati Hospital uh, for their radiation treatment. So we had a, a steep learning curve to really understand um, what we wanted out of uh, Proton Therapy Center. In 2012, we uh, started our formal process um, of an RFP. We formed a committee that had uh, um, oversight into the selection process. A number of different people from a whole host of different areas within the hospital, and they all had different uh, um, or different uh, ideas of what was important to them in the selection process. And we began contract negotiations with Varian in 2013, which was just about a full year before signing our contract. So we ended up with, at that point, there was only one vendor with a um, single room solution. And at that point, there was no pencil beam in a single room solution. So we defaulted into a multi-room uh, uh, system. And as Jay mentioned, with our uh, research component, we ended up investing in a research gantry, a $23 million investment on the hot part of the hospital for the whole research area within our Proton Therapy Center. We have two clinical gantries, one for adults, one for pediatrics. We have room for a third um, gantry, as well as future areas for um, linear accelerator and imaging. Just some of our construction fun facts as, as people getting into this will understand it's a, it's a big project, um, lots of concrete, lots of wire um, and lots of expense. So uh, as mentioned, we um, signed our contract with Varian in 2014. Um, and uh, started construction right after that, about a year and a half for um, construction. Uh, so uh, ready for equipment. Our first handover was in, um, first gantry handover was another year plus later, treated a month or so after that, which was only possible because of a, 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 a very um, talented physics staff with a lot of experience with our system. Um, and, and flash, or I'm sorry, and, and uh, uh, pencil beam, um, and first flash patient four years after that. Since we did integrate it within our hospital, we were able to um, utilize and leverage hospital support. Um, so we don't have separate billing, IT, or facility staff. We were able to leverage our existing contracts and uh, had our, our providers already um, in place. So kind of some lessons learned um, over, this, uh, over this journey. You know, early planning saves a lot of time and money. Um, before we started construction and even before, and even during the design process, we had mock-ups in a warehouse building that we owned um, close to our main campus. And we had all our providers, all our, um, we had our therapists, we had our nurses, we had our kind of our full staff going in there and working in there uh, for several months just to refine where we wanted things and were things in the right direction. So as a result, we, we had very few, if any, change orders during the construction process. Um, hiring the right people is important. Um, we, 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 we have a, a, a small staff, but it's a great staff. We've had very little turnover. Um, they've, been, they've been great at being able to uh, get us involved in, at the highest levels in uh, proton, um, proton therapy. Um, there's a long lead time between our contract um, and opening. At that point, when we signed our contract, pencil bean, um, Therapy was, uh, was, was not fully appreciated of where it was going to be at this point as, as, as the technology of choice. In fact, 
right after I joined, I attended a PT Tag NA conference, and there was a, a poll on what people preferred to use to treat on, whether that was a, a scatter or pencil beam, and it was it was an even vote almost at that point. So as you're you're looking at these uh, technologies, you need to look down the road and uh, uh, really pay attention to what's coming on and then be able to, to separate the wheat from the, the chaff. Uh, we initially had plans for a PET scan center in our um, facility to determine uh, the, the, the depth of the proton um, of the Bragg's peak and realized you know, that, that, that by the time that patient got to our, our, our PET scanner, they weren't going to be able to uh, um, the measure the depth as um, as critically as they thought. So there are a lot of things to uh, that, that pan out and others don't pan out. And having the right staff there to give the right opinions and views and research is, is critically important. Um, if you can future proof your center, what's going to What's going to happen? It's a long investment. It's not like a LINAC where you can just, uh, um, you know, replace it after five years. Where do you really want to be? What do you want to be when you grow up? What do you want to do? Do you want to be just a, a great treatment center? Or do you want to be um, in the front of research on biology, physics, um, or, or, or uh, therapy? Um, the proton community is small and very friendly. Um, there, there are resources all over to help um, get you educated and find out lessons learned, whether that's through PT COG, PT COG NA, or NAPT. And full disclosure, I'm board chair right now of, of NAPT. Things we learned about um, lessons learned as a respect to our vendor. Um, as one of the early centers, um, most of our issues that we had during our process won't be re um, um, won't be repeated. Um, um, I could tell war stories, but I could also tell stories of, of, of great commitment by our vendor to to our center, um, whether it was you know, having the site managers from Baltimore and, and uh, um, Cincinnati meet halfway in Pittsburgh to exchange a piece of equipment after something went down. Um, uh, and that kind of leads into the next bullet of building trust between the, the key facility staff and key vendor staff is really important. Um, but setting expectations on the vendor is equally important. And the, uh, that trust is not just leadership. It goes all the way down to uh, um, facilities. Um, consider what to focus on in the contract. It, it's, a, it's a daunting contract, purchase contract. The O&M contract is daunting. Um, if, if you don't know, get resources, but also understand that uh, you get the same machine, doesn't matter what the contract says. It's a really complicated system. There will be downtime, things will break. Um, and uh, just like a car warranty, they won't replace the engine the first time there's a little problem with it. There, it takes time to figure out what the problem is. Consider what backup plans you have. Um, you know, do you, if, if it's after so many days of it not working, do you uh, switch to photon? Do you have uh, arrangements with other proton facilities to take your patients and, and treat? How quickly can they get those patients on treatment? All are really important things to consider. And lastly, just wanted to focus on why we do this. It was fantastic. Just coming here, going around the campus, um, seeing the sun, you know, coming up. She looked around. Um, 
um, we were waving at everybody and I told her that you know, the nurses were up in the hospital waving down. People that didn't even know us were waving and she was just in awe. Jay, hand it out to you. Yeah, not a dry eye in the house. Thank you. Thank you so much for your uh, experience. Actually, maybe we have time for one question uh, uh, because this question from Alejandro Mazal. I can't ignore that. Uh, you, do you have figures on your real and expected uh, ramp up in the first year? You know, the, um... Part of the ramp up in the first year that you need to pay attention to is um, as they're still handing you gantries on a multi-room center, your hours are limited. Um, um, you don't have your, your full time as you do once the gantries are fully handed over uh, so that they can continue to uh, commission the other gantry. So we were only able to open uh, eight hours a day, treat eight hours a day uh, for about six months. Um, so we ramped up very quickly as a pediatric center. One of the um, one of the things we realized that as soon as we opened, we couldn't refer patients out anymore. Uh, that would be unsustainable to our leadership and to our team. So on the we had to treat the most complicated patients. Um, uh, on day one, and we had a pipeline of patients who were waiting for treatment. So I think it was the second week was the first patient we uh, treated under anesthesia. Um, so we, we really didn't have um, a long um, ramp up. We were just do a couple patients, uh, um, you know, a month and then um, take it on. The one thing we did realize people need to know is that you know, generally patients all have the same, about the same number of treatments. So you can't, can't have everybody start on day one uh, because you're, you're not going to be able to have capacity in the, the weeks ensuing and you don't want everybody on and off at the same time. Thank you. So uh, maybe, how do I unmute? Am I, can you hear me? I don't know. So thank yes. you. We'll come back to maybe questions if we have time uh, more. Uh, so we'll move to the, our second speaker. And I'd like to say that actually, I, I had the distinct privilege to meet Dr. Reddy in India during one of PT Cog's educational events. She was a, a gracious host. Priya Reddy is the executive vice chairperson of the Apollo Hospitals Group. She is widely recognized for her contributions in making high quality healthcare accessible to millions. And when you say millions in India, that uh, is meaning something. Millions and her support to various entities and industrial bodies, she has continuously worked for the betterment of India. Dr. Reddy works closely with the organization's 9,000 9, clinicians, and she introduces contemporary protocols to enhance the clinical outcomes. She, Dr. Reddy also works with industrial uh, bodies and the government of India to advance the policy decisions on health care. She was a founding member of the Quality Council of India. In recognition of uh, Apollo delivering outstanding medical care during COVID-19, which as we all know is a very difficult endeavor, and again thanks go out to all of our PTK community for the, all of the work that they did, but in that recognition, Preetha Reddy was awarded the Economic Times Businesswoman of the Year in 2021. She's also the recipient of many other awards. So we're privileged to hear her speak and we welcome her to PT Cog and look forward to hearing her perspective. Thank you. 
Thank you, Jay. Um, you know, it's good seeing you virtually, and I'm looking forward to a time when you're all back in India, every member of PGCOG. Having said that, you know, the pandemic has been devastating. It's kind of refreshing now to see a group of clinicians who are really talking about cancer and the future and what more we can do, because otherwise we've been just inundated with the other C, which is COVID. Having said that, uh, you know, it just goes back to our chairman's vision. Uh, Dr. Reddy's, my father, came back from the U.S. Um, to start what was then called, you know, just the, they call him the architect of healthcare in India, because at that time, the standards of healthcare were not what it is today. And having said that, I think, you know, thanks to him, uh, there's some fantastic healthcare systems which have been established in the country. And the government has also changed uh, the rules of the game, and they're doing a phenomenal job in the public health uh, systems. And so that, that there's been a sea change in what's happened in India. And as you know, we always tell each other, we are in the business of caring. And it's the caring which comes first and the business, you know, it follows because we are a for-profit entity. And you know, we, need, we have responsibilities towards uh, our shareholders. But at that point when, you know, chairman spoke to the board and said that when we work with cancer care, we need to do something which is really dramatically different, which then raises the bar on what is being done in the area of cancer care. While the Apollo Hospitals was established in 1983, today we run about, tw uh, about 12,000 beds. It has become a healthcare ecosystem. So there are hospitals, pharmacies, primary healthcare centers in the remote uh, villages, um, remote um, health, telemedicine, and multiple other factors of how we deliver healthcare. And at the core of it is that, you know, as an organization, it's still patient centric. And we try and do whatever we can to reach out to our public, uh, to our patients. Uh, the cancer journey started about 20 years ago, and we're in 14 uh, centers, 14 cancer care centers uh, spread across uh, India. But the Proton Center is in the city of Chennai, where we actually started, uh, you know, the first cancer hospital and the first Apollo hospital. And um, it is uh, in, a, in a beautiful location. It's, it's a lovely building. And I do invite all of you to come and take a look. What is nice is that, you know, while I didn't really put a, a picture of the interiors, it's got beautiful people and beautiful art, which was really donated by uh, multiple well-wishers uh, of the entity. Uh, the, the center, of course, is 150 beds, uh, advanced in the way it does. It's totally integrated. Uh, it does the kind of work which each one of you are doing so well and so brilliantly in your systems, multidisciplinary teams. It's got the pencil beam. Uh, it, it, of course, does more than children. Uh, while there is one room which is largely dedicated to treatment of children, one gantry, uh, we do a lot of head and neck lung, uh, GI cancers, and of late, uh, even breast cancer. So I think it's, uh, you know, it, uh, it covers adult and pediatric cancer.
So it's uh, it's been an interesting journey. And as you saw in the last slide, um, everything needs divine blessings and the hand of God. And as a family, we're very spiritual. And every patient who comes in, uh, whichever religion they belong to, uh, there's a little prayer which is said by the whole team before we even start on the treatment. So there were multiple prayers, multiple pujas, because uh, the challenges were huge. Uh, while I haven't listed it out, I would really like to acknowledge that the board, to get board approval actually took us uh, almost a year because when chairman went and presented the cost and his vision and dream to the board, they said, you know, we're not such a large healthcare company and this is not being funded uh, by anybody giving you grants. This is, you know, you really have to go to the bank. Are you sure Dr. Reddy? And then Dr. Reddy had to convince the board to say that this is really going to make a difference uh, in the way the cancer outcomes are and in the way people are going to be treated. So finally, you know, the board approval came, which itself was a, was a great milestone. And I'm so grateful to our board members for approving it. Having said that, the technology was so new. Uh, the word proton was uh, in people's minds. It was something very close to the atomic bomb. And nobody knew beyond that. And they said, what are you people trying to do? So we visited many centers and uh, multiple hosts. And I really want to thank uh, MD Anderson um, and um, the Miami Cancer Center. Um, you know, they spent so much time. Dr. Minish Mehta at that time was actually at, at Maryland at, at Baltimore. And he spent two days telling us and explaining to us what we were going in for. And then getting the approvals was a challenge. But again, the government needed time to understand what it all was about. So that was, uh, that was a challenge, but we had to overcome. A construction company in India who had never done anything like this, um, conceptualized, built, uh, built those bunkers, brought the cyclotron in, but it was Larson and Tubro, and they were great partners. They were with us 24 seven. We spent a lot of time at site. And of course, you know, the sites in India, again, the choice is a bit hard. And sometimes when it rains, it floods. So we went through two floods at that time and realized that, you know, we really have to figure that out, which, which then again, they did. They, they were uh, very differently done drainage systems to see that it never happens again. Uh, the supply of electricity was a big problem. Things which in developed countries people take for granted for us was a challenge because we really didn't understand the requirements, but we did that. And then the physicists, of course, were brilliant. And uh, you know, the, um, there were some outstanding centers in the U.S. With, who took them on uh, you know, with open arms to train them and our clinicians. And we're so grateful to all of them for that. Uh, India, again, as you know, it's a large country, large population, but the cost, uh, you know, the cost of care is still very hard on our patients and on our people. So when it was, the price and the cost w w was an issue, and I think uh, just creating the awareness on the outcomes and the value proton therapy brings both to the doctor community and to the patients was a large, was a huge challenge, but I think we're working on it. I, I wouldn't say that we've overcome it, but I think that again is a challenge which we're facing still and we're working towards overcoming. Uh, again, the expansion plans, uh, you know, if not uh, during COVID, we probably, we've treated about 350 patients, but we know that we'll be able to do much more and as far as cancer care goes, uh, you know, we love saying that it is the jewel uh, in, for the nation because, you know, a lot of 10% of our work is still treated free. So um, for the nation and for the country, I think it is a jewel. But having said that, there are two more. Um, and as we speak, two more coming up in the country. And we are hoping to do one more in the north of India. So I think uh, very strong expansion plans but something which we really would like to do. Uh, again, the cost of treatment, as I said, uh, you know, today is a big challenge. And uh, while the chairman, his vision is that, you know, we really have to provide proton therapy for those who care. 
We've also very innovatively got into crowdfunding and we've been able to raise funding for over 20 children who needed proton therapy at this point. And so the crowdfunding platform has really caught on as uh, an ideology in the country because people are really wanting to contribute. And we've just started our uh, pediatric children's cancer fund, which again will help us fund a lot of children who need cancer because the numbers are large within the country. Uh, the pediatric cancer and the head and neck cancer to me seem, you know, is the largest number and finding ways and means to fund that. Uh, just recently we had a breakthrough where insurance also recognized that you know proton therapy can be part of uh, you know an insurance plan so they have also funded at this point about 15 patients and we are hoping that that will continue and that will then be the stream of funding otherwise that used to be something which we were all very worried about having said that uh, we had a very strong relationship with all the clinicians uh, of PTCOG, and I really want to thank everybody for that, because if not, uh, you know, for the support, for everyone being just so forthcoming every time our clinicians had questions, issues, I don't think we would have got where we are, uh, where we are today. And uh, I would love to have the honor of uh, of really. Um, hosting uh, PTCOG again whenever you know you all would uh, like to come to India and as always you know um, not being a, a doctor clinician I can always request all the clinicians on this uh, platform that in the area of research I feel there is so much more we can do and if we can be part of any of your clinical studies any of your research programs uh, it would be an honor for us to be part of that and uh, you know we would welcome you with open arms and uh, and for that i think um, it's an open invitation um, the other request and you know uh, where i would love to find answers is that how do we future proof ourselves uh, honestly right now you know we are in a firefighting mode we're trying to see let's fund patients and try and treat patients with great outcomes as much as we can. So I think all the focus has been there. But how can we future proof so that this does become a standard of care? Uh, people will be able to afford it. And uh, whatever lessons are learned by, you know, choices of either software or the machine and the machine giving trouble, you know, all that is a repository of knowledge. Uh, there were about 40 when we started. There are over 100 globally. So can we have a central repository of knowledge for those who are going forward and doing this? So these were just some thoughts for the future. And it's all about collaboration. And that's why, you know, um, even being able to spend a few minutes on a platform like this is a huge learning for people like us. So thank you so much for the invitation. It is uh, truly an honor. And at any time, uh, if there is anything we can do from this part of the world, um, we would be delighted to host, interact, and uh, be part of this very elite and august audience. So thank you for the invitation. And Jay, I'm open to any questions if, uh, if the audience has. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Reddy, for sharing that experience with us. Uh, uh, and I think PT Cog is in fact a repository of information and help, and we just have to make that help more available to everybody. So I, actually, I have two questions. <laughs> One question is, I have to get a copy of that picture you showed at the end. So can you please yes. send? Of course, of course. Yes. And the the second question is, you you and your your teams visited MD Anderson and other places. Did you feel like that was enough to get you started? Did you find that when you started to treat patients, you wish you had had other experiences or training? So I think, you know, I must thank IBA. They, they're our uh, technology. We invested with IBA. 
and they facilitated a lot of training. Uh, There's still virtual calls which continue uh, between the physicists and the physics team and the clinicians and the clinic team. So I think the learning is never enough and the interactions always continue. But I think the visit was more for me to realize the magnitude of the project. I mean, I did not imagine that the cyclotron or, you know, just the whole uh, machine behind that proton in front would be three floors or three stories. Uh, I did not envisage the fact that the bunker had to be so many meters deep and thick and the concrete walls. So I think there was a lot of learning for me personally, and the teams continue to work together and learn. I see. Very good. Very th Thank you again. Uh, uh, again, if you have questions in the, uh, who, the listeners, please uh, uh, ask them on Slido, and we can make sure that the speakers get those questions and maybe be able to respond to you. So uh, we've heard experiences about the uh, uh, development of centers uh, from two completely different cultures. And one common denominator in those are the vendors who uh, supported and helped the, uh, the clients to, to, to develop and, and install and construct those facilities. And we have the exhibition here. Uh, we have always had the exhibitions. And, and I want to restate again that these exhibitions are not a place uh, behind some door at PT Cog, uh, where you go shopping, and and I don't think we have in the past maybe given them enough status within the context of all of PT Cog. So I want to spend a little bit of time to try to give you some sense of where where they fit in the in the context of our our field. So this is uh, entitled PT Cog and the sponsor exhibition because it really is a, a joint exhibition. So what does a vendor do? A vendor plays a significant role in many activities associated with the development of the particle facility. Sometimes with the help of others, it, sometimes it introduces you to other people who can uh, help with you. But the vendor wants to maintain a relationship with their clients for future activities to support the vendor's operations, and to support the client's capabilities. So if you look at the tasks of a PT center, which we just heard about from Abram and Pritha, there are a range of tasks from the conceptual design, financing, regulatory, installation, commissioning, operation, and maintenance. All of these things are part of the role of the vendor. It's a major, major undertaking. And sometimes maybe it's a little bit uh, it, maybe it's not talked about enough. So, so that's sort of one context. Another context is PT COG. And there is in some sense a synergy between the sponsors and PT COG. It's the mission of PT COG to promote science, technology, and the practical clinical application of particle therapy and it's, an, it's a mission of PT COG to ensure that it's the highest possible standard in radiation therapy. What are the missions of vendors at PT COG? They show their products, we all know that. They educate clients and hope to encourage sales. Let's just be practical about that. But what is it that encourages sales of proton therapy? It is to promote the use of pro particle therapy. So that is compared with one of the missions of PT COG to promote the application of particle therapy. And they certainly want to make better project products, which means listening to customers and getting the highest possible standards, which is another one of the missions of, of PT COG. There's more synergy. Uh, PT COG actually provides tangible contributions to particle therapy. To serve and accomplish its objectives, PT COG encourages improved and continuing educa education it promotes global activities. It supports the organization of dedicated international conferences, scientific meetings, and educational sessions. We have workshops, educational outreaches. We have subcommittees that publish white papers, consensus guidelines, and publications. Many actual publications have come out of our PTCOG subcommittees in the last several years. And PTCOG provides funding for research studies. What do sponsors do? Uh, they fund workshops, 
and they want to learn more about par particle therapy to enhance their products. So they have user groups and the user groups actually uh, uh, have workshops together. They also fund some research. So in some sense, there's even potentially more than a synergy between the sponsors and the uh, PTCOG. It could be that they could be more tightly coupled and these have been discussed in the past, but we have a clear mission and we should not separate in some sense aspects of the sponsors from PTCOG and what that mission is, except that our mission from PTCOG is altruistic. I think that from the point of view of funding in PTCOG, look at some of the examples. We began in 2018. We have already funded more than on uh, the other four projects and with, with really good results. And in fact, the announcements uh, for applications to projects in 2021 will be distributed soon. So the, take this as notice that you will soon see the applications on the PTCOG website and you're invited to, pro to submit proposals to uh, have funding for projects. It's also the case that we have established awards uh, in order to uh, uh, support the mission of the highest standards. So we have the Michael Goitin Best Abstracts Awards in Physics, Biology, and Clinics. We have a Young Investigator Awards, and we also began giving out those awards in 2017. Uh, so this really supports our idea of encouraging young people and encouraging the scientists in our field to develop the highest standards and the highest uh, academic and, and, and practical capabilities. And in fact, if you come to the closing ceremonies uh, uh, on Monday, you'll, you'll learn who are the PTCOG 59 2020 winners for these PTCOG awards. PTCOG has expenses. We do have a travel fellowship program, which has been supported by, uh, uh, which we, in which we support young scientists to travel to the PTCOG conferences. And uh, we, we certainly hope that next year we'll be able to support people traveling to Miami for the, for the next PTCOG 60. And the sponsors have been, and they are continue to be invited to continue sponsoring our travel fellowship program. And now, and actually starting with the help of our Abram Gordon in Cincinnati, uh, PTCOG has full financial responsibility for the meeting organization. Uh, after Cincinnati, it actually sort of begun online by, 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 by de facto, because it was an online conference in 2020, PTCOG 59 online, and the first physical meeting uh, of the full financial responsibility comes in 2022 in Miami. And sponsors are an important part of funding these meetings. So let's not be shy about the fact that uh, we have expenses and, and, and we have to support what we do. Uh, and we've had meetings since 1985. Can you believe it? We are already in our 36th year of, of, of meetings uh, all over the world. And more advertisement come to the closing ceremonies uh, on Monday to find out who will be the host of the PTCOG 62 uh, in Asia. So PTCOG has, in some sense, they have ass we have assets. We have an organizational structure in some sort of loose sense. And what we have is 4,500 members, 4,500 members, which feed all of our uh, elements of the organization. These are growing at about an incredible 100 a month. Uh, PTGOG has a steering committee with 81 members from 23 countries. There are 103 uh, uh, facilities in clinical operation now, and we have uh, about 15 subcommittees and working groups with a dozen plus publications that have uh, really helped identify what we, what's happening in the field. And here's an example of where these 103 facilities are. And I think it's time to start expanding outside of the uh, uh, Northern Temperate Zone. We have registrations to these conferences and here's the, the, red, mar the red bars are the totals. Each year, the uh, smaller bars are the totals in Europe, North America and Asia. And of course the, uh, the maximum 
of each of these totals changes depending upon which region in the world we are meeting. But you can see that on the whole, uh, our, our registrations keep rising. The registration count for this meeting was uh, over 1,100 already. Um, and, 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 and these thing, these, these meetings keep growing. We have really a, a robust uh, program of scientific, uh, uh, scientific presentation. We have over had 430 abstracts. They are distributed among Europe, North America, and, and Asia in, in physics and clinics and biology. And the biology keeps growing. If you look down here, and uh, this particular year, there's a, a very large amount of abstracts that came from, from Europe, but I think that, that that fluctuates. It's always Europe, Asia, and North America, which is in fact where we have the meetings. So it's really, really satisfying that we have such strong growth in our science. Our sponsors are multivaried. They uh, uh, come from all over. And here are some of the sponsors for this PTCOG 59. And I don't want to single anyone out, but I do want to remind you that uh, uh, you, should, you should be sure to, to go to CRC Press and sign up for the raffle so you can win vouchers for uh, books from CRC. You have to go to the booth and sign up if you wanna be able to be eligible for, the, for this raffle. And while you're at it, visit all the other sponsors. So these sponsors actually uh, have many different categories. They are particle therapy systems, dosimetry, shielding, treatment planning, instrumentation, software and controls, positioning, financing, lighting, publications, journals, and books. So go to the exhibition. You may learn something you didn't know you needed. And finally, I just want to officially say that the exhibition in PTCOG 59 is officially opened. So make your way to the sponsors, say hello, uh, sign up for the raffle. And uh, one more time, I wanna see you at the entertainment at the end of the session. Please come and meet me at the bar or the Japanese garden and enjoy the rest of your day. <laughs>